Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, in this section, we are in section, well, we're starting section 2.2, which is about linear modeling, which I should mention the word modeling or applications, these are sort of like politically correct terms. Uh, so we don't trigger people with words like story problems. Ooh, these are kind of scary things at times, but it is actually a very important part of studying functions. When we first learned about functions at the beginning of this series, I mentioned there was four ways of representing functions. We had numerical representations, often as a table, right? We had uh, geometric representations as a graph, algebraic representations by some formula. And the last one we haven't talked a whole lot about uh, these, these verbal descriptions. This is what a story problem is all about. We have a relationship between quantities that are related, that, that are described in words, in common, common language that we use. We'll, of course, use English in this course, right? And so being able to decipher what is the function relationship given a description is a very important concept. Difficult, don't get me wrong. It's like translating from French to Spanish or something like that. Some people might be able to do it easier than others, but in general, it's still a difficult process. And that translation will be difficult. Your typical story problem is, but is, is, I mean, it's very, very much real life type stuff, right? But your typical story problem will often work in the following way. We will be given a function described to us via some type of story, some, some written or verbal description. We then need to translate that verbal description into an algebraic representation and then use the tools of algebra to answer the question posed by the problem and then translate it back into some statement about the verbal description. We can't just end with a number and be like, great, the answer is seven. Seven what? What does that mean? We have to interpret things here. And that is a little bit challenging, but it's very important that we do such a thing. So in this first video about linear modeling, because uh, this is the type of modeling we're going to start off with, linear functions are the simplest of all type of functions. That way we can focus mostly just on the verbal descriptions and not so much on the algebra itself. Um, one type of uh, use linear functions has is the idea of population modeling. Uh, we can model the growth of various quantities, whether those are people or animals or money or other things. We can talk about population models. It just means that stuff is growing over time. Again, oftentimes we think of people or other things, and linear growth is an acceptable way of modeling. Now, when it comes to actual nature, like you talk about it, the spread of infectious diseases or population growth of people in cities or in animals and ecosystems, linear model is not exactly the right, the right model there. We'll see some better models later on. A uh, linear model is appropriate when there are sort of like a restriction, like if you take the student body at SUU, for example, the university actually has control on how many students will we admit each year. And so because of that control, the university could say something like, oh, we're going to we're going to allow an extra 100 students each year come into the school in terms of admissions. And that in that regard, we actually since we're sort of controlling how many people are coming in, then we actually do get a linear growth. Um, or another situation, if you're like pumping water into a tank, oh, if we're pumping at a rate of 10 gallons per minute, then that's this constant inflow. And that would be a, that would be a sort of like a, a quote unquote population growth for which we would use linear growth. Linear growth happens when there's a constant increase per unit of time. So for example, let's say we have a fictitious town population that's growing linearly. That just means that every unit of time it grows the same amount irrelevant of outside factors. In the year 2004, the population of this small town was 6,200. And then in 2009, the population grew to 8,100. Assuming this trend continues, can we predict what the population would be in 2013? So how would we predict this what we would predict this to be. Well, one thing we could do here is we want to figure out essentially how many people is the town growing per year. That essentially is finding the slope of this thing. Uh, if this thing is growing linearly, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a linear function f of x equals mx plus b. The m right here is going to be the rate of growth. And so we have to make this rise over run. What's the change of population the change of population with respect to time, right? So it went from, you know, it went up to 8,100. It came from 6,200. And this happened over the time frame 2009 to 2004, which is a five-year span, right? So the denominator here is a five. If you take the difference on top, you get 1,900. 
So over that five years, the people gained 1,900. And then if you divide 1,900 by five, you get 380. So what we want to think of here is right here is what is this 380? The in, this Our population is increasing eight, 380 people per year. And so it's oftentimes important to start mentioning units when you work with story bombs. This isn't just some arbitrary number 380. It has a, has a real life interpretation. The city increased 380 people per year. Keep the units in track there. And a slope is a ratio. It's a rate of change. Your rate of change should have two units, one unit divided by another. This is a rate of people per year. The fact that this is a positive 380 per year means the city is growing. If we had a negative 380, that means that the city would actually be decreasing. Uh, maybe there's an exodus out of the city for, for whatever reason. Now, you could then try to figure out, like, okay, how much farther from 2009 is 2013, right? So we could very quickly determine that this is, you know, four years later, in which case then you're going to take 4 times 380, add it to the current population, go from there. That's perfectly fine. Um, I do want to kind of show you a slightly different approach, which is basically the same thing. Uh, but this strategy is going to be helpful in more general situations. Because after all, when you give it a story problem, your goal as a student is not actually to answer the story problem, right? Do we do we need you to, to decide how many people are going to be in this city in 2013? No. I mean, one, this city is fake. It's not a real city. And even if it's, if, even if it is, these, the city has people to do this type of job, you know, city planners and things like that, right? That's their job. Why are you doing this? The reason you are doing this is not to make the prediction, but to understand this mathematical analysis, how that you can use functions to model data and thus make predictions, make forecasts based upon that data. That is a very relevant skill for you that you could use in the future if we know how to do it. So don't focus on finding the answer. Focus on how do you get the answer. That, that might seem a little bit different, but the goal is not to actually find the prediction. The goal is to understand a strategy that will give us to that prediction reliably here. And that's where this modeling of functions is going to come into play here. When you're coming to modeling functions, you have to decide your x coordinates, and your x coordinates do not necessarily have to coincide with the numbers that you're given here. Because we have the years 2004, 2009, 2013, you might think that, oh, I'll just set x to be the current year of x 2004, 2009, 2013. That's perfectly acceptable. But what you can also do is the following you could then set x equals 0 to be 2004. There's no reason you can't start your time frame there. Uh, which would tell us that 2009 is actually year five with this model. And then, to, then we get that 2013 will be year nine in terms of this model. Like if we start graphing the population growth, are we going to start at year one AD? Or are we going to probably start it at 2014? So in some essence, our projection starts at 2014. And so that's time zero. Uh, that's going to be our X equals zero right there. Which that does modify our rate of change right here. Our denominator would look like 5 minus 0. But notice 5 minus 0 is still 5, right? When it comes to the slope, the actual location doesn't matter. It's the change that matters. This is a rate of change. And whether x the starting value is x equals 0 or x equals 2004, it's a difference of 5 years. So that won't change in the denominator irrelevant to that. The, the slope is still 380. That does affect, of course, the x-intercept. One of the advantages of setting x equals 0, sorry, it would change the x-intercept, but I meant to say it would change the y-intercept. One of the advantages of changing x equals 0 to be correspond to 2004 is that the y-intercept would then be that value, 6,200, right? So by convenience, I have the slope-intercept form basically immediately. My function f of x equals 380x plus 600 or 6,200 right here. This then gives me a model for this city's population, for which case then I want to look at f of 9. I'll get 380 times 9 plus 6,200, in which case 380 times 9, that is 3,420. We add that to 6,200, and we see that the predicted population will be 9 1620. And so it's good to actually explain what's going on here. So we would actually probably say something like the following. Um, in the year, in the year 2013, we expect, let me make this a little bit bigger for us. We expect the 
pounds population to be 9,620 people. When it comes to a story problem, it's really best practice to have a story answer. There should be some sentence that explains the context of what that number means. Now, when you work with like a website like WebAssign or My Math Lab or whatever, you know, they often just have a box that you type in the answer and so it does all this writing for us. And so therefore we forget that we should actually be interpreting what does this number mean. And the number is our, is our prediction. We predict to be about 10,000 people in the year uh, 2013. And I should mention that this number right here is probably going to be wrong, right? I mean, we, the, at, the, at the time of the recording of this video, we're seven years past 2013. We could actually check if you had this town data, was this right or not? One doesn't expect the answer to actually be perfect. Modeling is not about being perfectly right. It's about being estimates, right? You know, people complain about the weatherman like, oh, he said the temperature high today was going to be 79 degrees and it was only 77, right? Sure, sure, off by two degrees Fahrenheit. It's not so significant, right? But, you know, if, if they predicted the temperature was going to be 79 degrees and then it's like, oh, it turned out to be 47 degrees outside, that's a big difference, right? You know, you might have wanted to wear a coat when you went to school today. So these are supposed to be predictions. They're not exactly right, but they're supposed to be close. And so that's what modeling is all about. Um, another important question would be, so like we've answered the question, when in 2013, what do we expect the population to be? We expect to be 9,620. 9, but other times we have to answer questions like, when will the population reach 15,000? Maybe 15,000 represents some critical infrastructure uh, point for this town, right? Uh, if we, you know, if, this, if the population gets bigger, we expect more people will be driving, more water will be used, more trash will be created. Uh, how do we compensate for that, right? Well, we might need to figure out when is it going to reach 15,000? So how much time do we have to plan how to update the roads or the dump or the water or whatever the infrastructure is? This is a very important question. So if you want to identify the year in which the population will reach 15,000, we're trying to answer the question. We're trying to solve the equation f of x equals 15,000. We have to solve this equation. But once we have an algebraic formula for f of x, this doesn't become too much of a chore. We take 3,800 times x plus the 6,200. This equals 15,000. We then have to solve this equation. So we're going to subtract the 6,200 from both sides. This is going to give us 3,800x is equal to, well, 15,000 take away 6,200, which is going to be 8,800. Then we need to divide both sides by 3,800. This will cancel over here. We get 3,800. And so then x would turn out to be, uh, that turns out to be, if you want to be precise, that's going to be 440 over 19. Uh, but I think a decimal approximation is a little bit more fruitful here. Uh, you'll get 23.16. So basically this tells us, you know, approximately 23, I'm just going to round to the next year right here. Uh, so 23 years later, 23 year later, 23 years later from what from, right? So 23 years, 23 years later from um, our starting point, which was 2004. So then, with that estimate in mind, we'd probably say something like the following. So we expect, we predict. Again, let's make this text box a little bit bigger. We predict the town's population will reach 15,000 around, uh, let's see, 2004 plus 23, that would be 2027. So again, this video was recorded in the year 2020, so our town hasn't reached that point yet. And so we'd expect about seven years from now, it'll reach that critical infrastructure point of 15,000. So our town will have to compensate uh, based upon whatever it needs to do to prepare for that population 15,000, but it'll happen around the year 2027. And so this is the basic idea of how we do linear modeling. We can use modeling to predict at a certain point in time, what will the population be? But we can also use the linear modeling to predict when in the future will we re reach some specific number of interest to us. So this comes down to function evaluation as part A, but also comes down to solving equations, which we did on part B here. And linear models come into play when we expect the growth or decay of the quantity to be constant with respect to time.